Ja, das ist gut. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for everybody to uh, join the webinar. Uh, try to make it a bit of a swinging, a swinging title with the 20s, uh, the 20s uh, survival guide for your data center. Uh, so we're certainly living in uh, very um, challenging, but also interesting times in this. Um, yeah, in what I should call this decade of action uh, towards a more sustainable uh, IT environment. And the, um, the survival guide is actually trying to um, refer to the combination of a more energy efficient operation of your data center together with a more sustainable uh, way of operating your data center. It is possible to combine those two, uh, but this would require to look with a fresh eye, uh, with an open view, to your existing um, energy consumers, uh, and we will look at the two biggest energy, energy consumers in the data center, and maybe also question some of the existing procedures um, and ways of operating. And then lastly, we'll look at um, yeah, a SaaS delivery model, software as a service, and how we can help uh, deliver those energy savings, and at the same time, um, you know, give the operator um, some peace of mind. So certainly in the context of what Olivier already said, uh, the proposals that we'll cover here are real solutions that can actually uh, reduce your carbon footprint. Uh, so no need for offsetting and other creative uh, ways of carbon accounting. And I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to look at this, uh, at this slide. So this is of course very interesting uh, and it's good for the environment because we have an extra tree but at the end of the day this methodology doesn't really change anything to the actual operation of the business this is what we want to avoid and this is also possible with um, you know with the solutions that we'll, uh, we'll talk about so first a quick uh, introduction on these on green uh, as an integrator so um, yeah, the mission of DC and Green is really to uh, accompany data center operators with their Green Deal transformation. Uh, we all know about it, uh, announced in 2020. Um, it's important to underline that this is a customized journey. Uh, every operator has a different uh, data center, different legacy, different applications. So the road to get to the top of the mountain, you know, where the vision and the mantra is, uh, this is of course different for, uh, for every uh, operator. And to reach that goal, there's a number of tools that I uh, dispose of and that I make available to the, um, you know, to the customers. The first one is, um, yeah, what I call AAA, nothing to do with alcohol, I think. It's um, advisory, uh, energy audits, uh, environmental assessments, so broadly speaking, consultancy. Um, if the customer wants, we can also move to the next step, which is implementation of solutions and putting into practice what the audits might have turned up with. So here we're talking about specific point solutions, but also turnkey solutions uh, for new built uh, greenfields. And then finally, there's also some interaction with investors for um, ESG qualification and due diligence of, uh, of data center assets. And the last uh, but important word is that as an integrator, there's also the role of the CSP, the communication service provider. And I've experienced that it's really important um, both internally and externally. Uh, externally, for example, is when you talk uh, between a data center operator and a city planning uh, office for uh, district heating and then uh, waste heat reuse. So that that type of uh, discussion. And internally, of course, the the classical one is the uh, the liaison between the IT department and the facilities department. Uh, sometimes that external third party is is needed to make the connection. 
So uh, starting with a bit of context, uh, more specifically the uh, data center market regulations in the EU. I already mentioned the, the Green Deal, which is quite vocal on uh, its ambition on data centers and IT specifically. So I'm, I'm quoting from the text uh, by 2030, uh, climate neutral, highly energy efficient and sustainable da data centers need to be uh, the case. And uh, in addition to that is also the transparency on the environment, on the environmental footprint on your journey towards 2030. So this is, of course, um, it's ambitious, but at the same time, it's still a bit buzzy. Um, what does it what does it mean exactly? Because at the end of the day, there's not yet a standardized definition on what a, uh, a sustainable data center looks like. So it needs translating and mapping towards, let's say, the immediate uh, future. And the EU has done uh, such a thing. There's a reporting and compliance regulation that is now uh, has become active or is becoming active very shortly. And there's three pieces of legislation which are really important. Uh, the first one is the Energy Efficiency Directive, uh, which is basically um, imposing for any data center with a, a minimum footprint, uh, IT footprint, to report on a number of sustainability indicators. And they are shown on the slide here. There's uh, six of them in total talking about energy use, uh, renewable energy, water, carbon, etc. So much more than the uh, usual suspect, which is the PUE. Uh, luckily, the debate has, has, has gone much bigger than that. Uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which was actually adopted yesterday by the, uh, by the European Parliament, uh, is effectively putting corporate sustainability information on the same footing and level as financial information. So it also needs to be externally audited. Uh, it's no longer um, an annex in the uh, annual report. It becomes the same weight. And then last but not least, the uh, EU taxonomy, which is all about um, uh, environmentally friendly investments. So. These things are actually already coming into play from next year onwards, 23 and 24. So it's certainly the remote target of 2030 is becoming much, much more uh, in proximity. And there's actually actions to be taken in the short term. And then the third step, uh, which is the, let's say, classical uh, reaction by the industry, uh, industry doesn't like to be regulated. Uh, they think the Commission doesn't know what they're talking about with data centers. So they come up with self-regulation. And uh, I guess self-regulation hasn't always been very successful in the past, if you look at the financial industry. But nevertheless, um, we have the Climate Neutral Data Center Pact, which was founded in 21, and which is also coming up with uh, five sustainability metrics um, with intermediate uh, targets for 25 and then uh, final targets for 2030. So the point is that there's a lot of things to be reported, to be measured, um, and it's important that those data are you know, made available. Uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, uh, and what you measure can be managed. But let's say I would make the case that regardless of the obligation towards the European Commission, there's also a very strong case for those data to be collected for your own purpose, for your own operation, um, um, optimizing your own operation, uh, your data sovereignty, basically. And then in second order, uh, use that data also to, uh, to report to the, uh, to the authorities. But that's only my opinion, and uh, I'd like to test this statement with the audience. And so there's a first poll, there's three in total. And, and this one is about, yeah, the data center sustainability reporting legislation. So there's, um, yeah, let's say three approaches. 
And one approach could be, OK, we follow the EU directives strictly. So the three pieces of legislation I mentioned. Number two is we take a step, a step back. We use our own creativity, innovation, perhaps to define some meaningful sustainability metrics for our own, let's say, operations, and then we report the subset uh, towards the Commission. And then uh, number three is no opinion. So let me see. Uh, we can launch the poll. Okay. I don't know if. But with us, some people are putting their answer in the chat, but we will be. Uh, we, Johan will provide a poll in a second. Otherwise, we can already see some of the answers in the chat. It's a mix of A and Bs for the moment. Okay. Beyond in the in the chat, we see uh, I would say a small majority of A, but yeah, it's probably equal between A and B with some additional comments like uh, A plus PCR on data center and cloud prepared by the ADEM in France. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm just trying to see. Uh... Probably should close the poll. I think everybody has had. Um... No, I think it was still active from the test that we done before, so I'm not sure that people saw it. But yeah, in the conversation you can see. Okay. Okay. Well, certainly interesting. Um, if the conclusion is a mixture of A and B, um, yeah, that's quite interesting to, because uh, I, I suspected that it was a bit of a provocative question uh, that people would maybe <laughs> mainly uh, imply or, or uh, follow the EU uh, directives, which are quite strict and, and, and uh, uh, impose um, a lot of uh, things to be reported. But it's good to know that uh, people are still uh, paying a lot of attention to their own uh, yeah, optimization of the operations and basically also their own data sovereignty. Because at the end of the day, even these type of data are also important um, to exploit, to do analytics and, and uh, all kinds of things. OK, so I propose we move on. Um, uh, Olivier, I don't know if the, if if the if the poll is still open or or do you see it on the screen or can I can I pursue? For me, you can pursue. I don't see it. I don't okay, know if okay. the other guys, if anyone else saw it, but I didn't see it uh, appear on screen. Okay, so I didn't. So some technical issues, but we'll manage. Yeah. Okay, good. Then uh, PUE. Okay, we can talk about data center sustainability without at least passing. Uh, through BUE and hopefully, as, this, as the title suggests, uh, move swiftly along and go beyond PUE. Um, I suppose everybody on the panel is familiar with it, but for those who aren't, PUE is basically, um, it's a proxy for uh, data center energy efficiency. And it's basically dividing your total uh, facility energy by the uh, energy consumed by the IT. So as I said, it's a proxy. Uh, it, it doesn't really say anything about efficiency. It's also called effectiveness and not efficiency. But um, we can see in the graph on the left that PUE has um, dropped down significantly, significantly over the last yeah, nearly 10 years. Uh, reaching a plateau uh, as, as, as we are today, uh, around 
1.5, which is still way off of the target of 1.3, which is proposed by the Commission and, and also this uh, Climate Neutral Data Center Pact. But still, there's a, a strong evolution that has taken place. Uh, we must, of course, underline that this is a global average, and we still see a lot of enterprise uh, data centers, uh, smaller outfits, uh, let's say around uh, 100, 200 kilowatts, which are which are all the way up the curve around 2.5 or even uh, or even worse. So it's a bit of a mixed a mixed message. We shouldn't uh, say, okay, that battle has been won. Uh, certainly. Hyperscalers are fine, but other facilities still need uh, improvement. Nevertheless, we can we can make the, the case that uh, if you want to improve PUE even further, uh, you probably need major investments. It's not always possible to retrofit in all data centers. So maybe we need to look beyond PUE. And then the DCIE value is an interesting one to look at. I mean, DCIE simply put is the inverse of PUE, uh, data center infrastructure um, efficiency. And if you look at um, a PUE of 1.3, which is the target that we all want to go to, then you can see that basically uh, the DCIE is 77.77. So that means that IT represents 70%, 77% of the total energy consumed by the facility. And that kind of puts the equation in the right order, I believe, which is to say, well, you know, maybe we should focus first on the IT part and not spend too much time anymore uh, on the building overhead, because that's what PUE is, uh, and start uh, looking at what's inside the racks, uh, which is the IT part. So um, when we do that, when we look beyond PV to other sustainability metrics, and we know that there's quite a few of them to be reported uh, to the commission, uh, the landscape becomes quite dry if you go beyond PV. So if you look at the top metrics that are reported, it's total consumption and its PUE. So these metrics are really focused on the uh, operations of the data center, um, total energy consumption. So they're more linked to the financial performance of the data center than sustainability. We have to be honest here. Um, so things like water usage is barely reported, server utilization, talking about the IT part here, only one in three, carbon emissions even lower, and then we, we're not even talking about scope three emissions, and then uh, circularity and, and recycling is also um, quite low. So conclusion is that, okay, we want to spend more time looking at the IT part of the equation, but certainly today, these metrics are not widely reported. And uh, OK, that's the conclusion we uh, we must uh, we must make. Then um, taking a step back from the PUE discussion and um, looking at the total data center, data center energy uh, consumption uh, and the splits between the different uh, components. Uh, you can see here that um, IT is effectively the largest uh, energy consumer in the data center, uh, anywhere between 50 and, and 70 percent or 65 percent is, uh, is IT. Cooling is typically around 35 to 40 percent, uh, and those are, those are really the, three, uh, the two um, biggest um, energy consumers. Uh, note that this is not really a very efficient data center. This one, this is um, 1.9, something like that PUE. But it's just to paint a picture that, um, you know, what is consuming most energy. Uh, then we have the Code of Conduct, which is um, a best practice document issued by the Commission 
um, in 2008, so it's quite old. And it's basically a set of best practices, um, 160 in total, to improve the energy efficiency of the data center. And the good thing about it is that it's covering both the data center facilities, so cooling, power, what have you, but also the IT sides of the, um, of the data center. And um, the Commission or the Joint Research Center did um, a study to find out, OK, well, which of the best practices are most implemented by operators and which ones are least implemented? And the conclusion was that the most implemented um, best practices were the ones that didn't require any substantial investment, uh, kind of low hanging fruit, so to say, uh, but still some discipline uh, and process is, is mandatory. And here we're talking about the classical suspects, uh, hot, hot, cold aisle containments, um, putting blanking plates uh, in, the, in, in the racks, uh, using perforated doors, uh, light, uh, low energy lighting, uh, things like that. So th those were the most implemented um, best practices. Then, of course, they also made a second list, which is, OK, well, which one are the least implemented best practices? And they came to the conclusion that these were practices that were less uh, less, uh, less uh, evident. They would span multiple teams, IT and facilities, uh, would require uh, multidisciplinary um, changes uh, and also major strategic changes in the operation of the data center. And the examples cited here were server power management tools, uh, revising the complete cooling strategy um, and requirements, uh, using energy efficient software and things like that. So the conclusion is basically that, OK, we have the two biggest energy users in our data center, IT and cooling. And unfortunately, all the best practices that touch these two domains are actually least implemented. And of course, code of conduct is voluntary, but nevertheless, it's a bit of a missed opportunity um, and certainly um, yeah, room for or opportunity for, uh, for improvement here. So then, of course, we take a a little bit a closer look at those two domains, uh, cooling and IT, and see what we can do. So if we start with cooling, um, of course, this is a well-known uh, chart from the um, ASHRAE organization, uh, painting a picture of uh, environmental envelopes uh, for, in this case, uh, air-cooled data centers. ASHRAE has also made similar charts for uh, liquid cooling. But this is for air. And you can see a number of classes here. Um, recommended classes um, and, you know, which is basically between 18 and 27 degrees of air temperature coming into your servers. Uh, next to that, you have um, some allowable classes, A1 to A4 which is basically extending the temperature envelope to higher temperatures and lower. Um, and also humidity is, is part of that uh, chart. Now, the funny thing is when you talk to uh, vendors, uh, servers and, and storage equipment, uh, networking equipment, and you look at the data sheets, most of the equipment is actually sitting at A3 level. A2 or A3. So that means that the equipment is, is capable of accepting up to 40 degrees temperature on its inlet. Um, if you then go to a real life data center, you often encounter circumstances where cold air is, 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 is uh, introduced at 16, 17, 18, degrees. So a massive delta in supplied uh, airflow versus the tolerance of the IT equipment. And of course, the reason for that is 
poor airflow management and inefficient cooling. Um, there's, for example, contamination between cold air, hot, hot air, uh, lack of containment, uh, IT equipment which is put or installed uh, in the wrong way around in a data center, um, obstructions underneath the raised floor, uh, blocking uh, the, 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 the airflow, and of course, understandably, uh, in that circumstance, you need to supply more cooling and also at a cooler temperature. But the result, of course, is a massive um, waste of, of, of uh, money uh, in, in um, spent on, on cooling, which is yeah, not necessary. So that leads us to the second poll. Uh, not sure if everybody is that familiar with the data center operations, but just you know, we'll find out. Um, what inlet temperature are you applying for your data center? Uh, below 18, so just outside of the recommended envelope, between 20 and 24. Option C is more than 24, and option D is don't know. So let's see. We'll see if the I'll start the poll. Uh... Yeah, if it's not starting, we've got again answers in the chat. People are answering there. You've got. Mm. Mainly B's, I would say, and some D's, of course, and a bit of A and C, but. Uh... OK, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. Something is, is not going right with the polling because I should normally see them on the screen, but so we'll have to use a chat. Um, yeah. OK, so. Seems to be mainly B and Mr. Deschutter is saying we followed Ashray at the time, so B. So the okay. two saying C for small computer room. Yeah, okay. So yeah, still a couple of A's still. And then a lot of B's, okay. Yeah. Maybe I should have put in an option more than 27 because then at least we're going into the allowable uh, range of, of temperature classes. Um, but you can still see there's a you know, even with this result, an enormous delta between uh, temperature tolerance of the IT equipment and the actual air that we're uh, introducing. And if you take into account that every degree that you can increase your inlet temperature, you're saving 4% uh, on your cooling energy, the opportunity is, of course, is, is, is massive. But for that, um, we will need a bit of assistance. Because, of course, you can't just increase temperatures like that. Uh, the main purpose of the data center is still reliability and uh, resiliency, so you don't want to risk uptime. So you need some help from, um, from friends, and AI could provide a solution here, artificial intelligence-based cooling optimization. So if you look at, at most of today's data centers, you see a bit of a dark picture. You see monitoring of the cooling machines in, in the data center. And the colors here in the chart refer to uh, temperature ranges. So these boxes are the cooling machines, the cracks. But in a lot of cases, the actual racks are not monitored. You might have a sensor in the room. Even if you have containment, you might have one sensor in, in, in the hot or the cold aisle, but certainly you don't have the, the full detailed picture. So the first thing you want to do is uh, increase the granularity of your uh, monitoring and data capture and instrument basically all your racks with sensors. Um, temperature, humidity, and immediately the real picture 
becomes visible. It's like you're switching on the light and you can see hot spots here in this room, you know, with the red and the yellow rack, so high temperature. You can see cold spots on this side of the room. So, so certainly that room is not well balanced uh, and there's a problem. And there's also uh, there's the risk, potential for risk, certainly in this area. And there's also rooms for improvements. And then you start uh, applying your artificial intelligence and machine learning model on this room. Uh, it starts to learn the behavior of the room. You need like maybe uh, a week uh, or two max of data collection. And the, the model will actually also learn the correlation between the cooling machines and the racks. And then come up with uh, propositions suggestions how to improve uh, the efficiency uh, in the room and also how to reduce risks. So for uh, a number of customers, we have developed um, what we call uh, optimization roadbooks. And basically the, the, the key message, the message is that start first with inst installing your monitoring system and then implement step by step each of those um, improvement tracks. For example, uh, you would change the direction of certain uh, IT servers, um, you know, which are, are blowing into the wrong direction. And immediately you will see the effect. Uh, if you put in, uh, into place containment, same thing. You install the containment, you look at the effect on the room, and you can adjust or um, increase the inlet temperature of your, of your um, your cooling machines. And the nice thing about um, this AI assisted data center operation is also that it's it's basically um, giving you multiple benefits. Um, uh, it was it, it was used in the beginning by um, Google uh, 2018. And the main focus was energy savings. They were claiming 30% of energy savings. Um, and we also see the same thing with, with this solution here across the um, data centers that is being installed. It's, it's roughly 30%. But there's also additional benefits that you can uh, get from that. So I'm taking the example of this customer here. This is a financial customer. And um, you know, they were experiencing some some hotspots uh, in the area. Uh, as you can see here on this on this first graph, uh, in that area of the room, there's, uh, you know, uh, higher temperatures. Uh, the usual way of solving this is throwing more cooling at the problem. Uh, unfortunately, in this in this uh, customer case, there was no cooling available. Every available cooling unit was switched on. And by um, gathering and analyzing the data, it was actually discovered that two of those uh, cooling machines were actually competing with the other cooling machines. So they were recirculating the hot air that was coming from the, uh, from the racks. And basically, they were making the problem even worse. So the conclusion was uh, after uh, performing the analytics uh, was to put those two machines in standby and ending up with a more you know, uh, balanced room, which you can see on the right hand of the slide. So this is an example of, 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 of a solution that is giving you the energy savings. It was 32% in, in, this, in this customer case. You have reduced your risk, you know, with by removing the hotspots, and suddenly you have uh, cooling capacity available, which was not the case before. So it's 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 quite a strong proposition, and um, yes, yeah, certainly the risk aspect is 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 becoming more and more important. Uh, I think we all um, were aware of of yeah past summer with forty degrees in Europe. Uh, heat waves and with um, quite a few uh, high visible uh, data center outages like um, Google uh, in the UK, 36 of downtime, 
uh, Oracle, 22 hours of downtime, and both of them were linked to, uh, to cooling failures. Right, so then um, we move into the next big chunk of the, um, yeah, the biggest energy consumers in the data center. So we've covered IT. Um, then we have the, uh, so, sorry, we covered uh, the cooling. And now we're uh, talking about the IT uh, side of things. So uh, there's two um, elements to look at in this discussion. Um, first one is IoT server power management, and the second one is idle server detection. So if we start with the first one, and you can see uh, in the slide on the left, um, this is a graph showing uh, power usage uh, in function of uh, load according to a specific search test. And this is for a specific type of server. Um, and every server basically has two um, profiles, uh, power management profiles. Um, one is called performance, the other one is called uh, efficiency mode or balanced mode. There's, there's quite a few um, definitions for it. Um, and the difference in power usage is, is gigantic. So if you apply power management, so you, you select the energy efficient system profile, you have a reduction in this case for idle power of 41% versus the profile in red, where you have picked up the uh, performance uh, system profile. Now, this is just showing you for a specific server, but there's other studies done, scientific studies, looking at a range of Intel uh, products. And the gap here between um, efficiency mode and performance mode for idle power can be like 100 or even 200 percent. So it's, it's, it's quite big and it mainly plays in the lower uh, utilization ranges of that uh, CPU. If you go to full power, then the two modes become actually quite, quite, uh, quite similar in in power um, um, consumption. Now, the, the 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 funny thing about it is that operators typically, and this is a would be a good polling question as well. Um, by default, we'll select performance mode because you know it comes out of the box maybe with power uh, performance mode um, enabled. You don't want to take a risk. You want the best performance for your application. But uh, there's studies that has shown that the performance gains that you have by selecting that mode versus energy efficient mode are actually minimal, maybe one or two percent, if if anything at all. So you don't get the benefits, but there's a big penalty uh, in terms of um, power consumption. So the ideal thing to do, of course, is that you enable power man management on your servers. Maybe not on all. Maybe there's some use cases where you really need that performance. But basically make um, a selection of your servers and applications and, and choose uh, a specific power profile depending on the on the workload type that they that they run. Um, now this problem here of idle power consumption is also interlinked with the second um, observation, which is about idle server. Because the more idle servers you have, the more this problem here is of course bigger. And I think it's fair to state that um, idle server is a problem. There is, um, or or let's say more generally speaking, a low server utilization is a problem. Uh, it is estimated that uh, average server utilization is something like 15 to 20 percent. Um, it depends really on the data center. Um, uh, hyperscale is typically a bit more, but enterprise is is like 15 to 20 percent. Um, idle servers, a lot of research has been done on that as well. 
anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of servers is running idle. Um, and there's a suspicion that in cloud, uh, that percentage is even much higher. But visibility into cloud performance is not always that straightforward. Um, but there's more and more proof that's coming out that um, IT resource waste in the cloud is actually quite significant. So it is a problem, idle servers and low server utilizations. So what do you do with it? Well, the first thing you need to do, of course, is uh, detect them. Uh, and there's different ways of, of detecting idle servers. Um, some, of their, some of them are intrusive um, in the sense that they will use um, scripts and um, agents to be put on the, on the server. Uh, which could cause concern, uh, security concerns. And then you have other methods which, which are non-intrusive. And this is um, a snapshot of a, of a dashboard and GUI that is um, provided by one of my business partners that is actually tracking uh, idle servers in a non-intrusive fashion by looking at the, the power profile. And of course, once you have detected uh, your idle servers, the next thing, of course, is to do, uh, well, what do you do? Uh, what action do you take? And um, typically the first action is uh, at least reporting. And then the IT administrators can decide what to do with those uh, idle servers. Um, for example, idle servers can be put into standby, can be yeah, so to say, shut down. Uh, servers which are lowly utilized can be consolidated into another server. Uh, you could even change the um, system profile uh, depending on the on the idleness of that server. So a lot of actions uh, can be taken, um, and this is also where this business partner excels at by using. Uh, machine learning um, and artificial intelligence. Uh, there's even, you know, methods by and, and linking it through an API by automating some of these actions. Um, normally, the IT administrator wants to have that final decision, but once a certain trust is built, uh, there's also ways of automating that uh, certain actions. And I think it's uh, safe to say um, if you increase your server utilization to the benchmark, which is proposed by the OEMs, the Dells, the EMCs, and the HPs, which is 50% of server utilization, and which is also what the hyperscalers have, you come to the conclusion that you can reduce your IT energy footprint by 50% only by changing by consolidating, by uh, you know switching to different system profiles. So, so the potential here is, 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 is huge. And that brings us then to the third poll and final. Um, the question is, is your organization applying server power man management settings and or tracking server utilization? Uh, you can do A is only power management, B is server utilization, C is both. And uh, D is, is don't know. We've got two B's in the chat, a D. I think I see why, uh, yeah. The polls were not. Uh... And several Ds, so most people don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Ah, and the poles are appearing suddenly. Yeah, yeah. I, I discovered <laughs> we're at the end, and I discovered why it didn't come through. It's it, there was still a, a different pole uh, active and open, so I couldn't. Uh, yeah. Yep. Anyway. Okay. So that's that's too bad. But anyway, we have the chat. Um, So a lot of these, uh, you said, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that that. Kind of proves the point that it's a bit of a of a of a hidden domain, uh, which is maybe under light, and which deserves uh, some some more attention. So uh, that's uh, that's really interesting. Maybe something to discuss afterwards with Emmanuel, who's saying we've tried power management on computers and results measured independently were disappointing. So we can keep that for the, okay. the chat afterwards. Okay, good. All right. And then, um, so we talked about, let's say, um, IT operations and, and, and uh, uh, system profiles and, uh, and things like that, consolidation. We can also have a look at the actual hardware estate of your of your servers, um, the energy efficiency. I mean, of your uh, of your servers and and ways to make it more energy efficient. So this is another business partner of of TCM Green. Um, so the first thing they do is they make a kind of a snapshot, uh, a benchmark of your current estate, uh, looking at. Um, um, make model CPU RAM, that's all they need. And then you have this kind of, of a picture of um, uh, distribution um, of age between your different servers. For example, in this case, customer has uh, a few recent machines, uh, but the majority, like 70%, is, is, is eight years old, which is maybe even beyond uh, a life cycle replacement, but, but nevertheless, um, that's the, uh, let's say, the snapshot of the current estate. And there is, a, of course, an energy consumption linked to that and also a certain workload uh, that can be performed by this, uh, by, this, by this estate. So then the question is, okay, well, is there a, a, a new version of my estate which is more energy efficient, more performant, and more carbon effective, but still delivers the same compute power. And again, this partner, they will have, they have a global uh, OEM database, uh, list of options and, and, and refurbished servers. And then they come up with the optimum replacement for your current estate. And for example, in this case, the mission was to minimize the, um, the energy consumption. And they came up with uh, a different model of server. Um, and as you can see, for this case, the energy consumption, which is this part here, you have the IT part and the, uh, let's say the data center part, was drastically removed or um, reduced rather. Um, you have some additional costs here taken into account for a five-year TCO. And even with the procurement cost for these new servers, uh, you ended up with 75% of reduction in energy. You could still deliver the same workload. And because uh, in this case, the 84 servers can be replaced by 15 servers, you also have, of course, a big reduction in scope three emissions. You don't need to purchase that, that much IT hardware. And even on the, if, if you're in a collocation data center, you don't need all the housing. So you also gain um, carbon on, on, the, on, the, on, the housing, on the housing part. Now, it's important to note that um, there's a lot of interim scenarios as well. You don't need to forklift your whole um, IT estate. You could also, for example, say, well, I will only replace my older servers or I will only replace the 10% servers that are least efficient, which maybe only give you 5% of the compute, but 30% of the energy bill. So that's all possible uh, with this tool. 
and the um, in some cases even reconfiguring the servers is already uh, you know a, a good way of reducing energy without replacing anything. So that brings me uh, to the conclusion of the webinar. Um, I think we've established that there's uh, yeah, a need for this data management framework and infrastructure. Uh, I would say uh, primarily for monitoring and optimization purposes, um, giving you insights into your own infrastructure and also opportunities for uh, improvement. And then in a second order, um, as we as we discovered in the first poll, it is also your uh, your cornerstone for your reporting uh, uh, and compliance uh, to the EU and other uh, national regulators. Um, when we looked at the top two energy consumers in the data center, I think it's fair to say that uh, even when the low hanging fruit uh, is, is, is supposedly uh, behind us, there's still massive opportunities. Uh, to to be, to be had on the cooling side you have the you have possibilities with ai uh, not only to save energy but also to have other benefits like um, risk reduction uh, capacity management uh, and and basically sweating your uh, your assets and on the then on the it side uh, also huge potentials for um, streamlining your it operations maybe consolidating or applying different power profiles um, and then also uh, upgrading your uh, current estate to more energy efficient estates. So I think in all honesty, it, it is possible to achieve maybe 70, 80 percent of reduction on the IT side. And it basically turns around completely the whole discussion we had in the data center world for the past 10 years where we were discussing about how to get from 1.3 to 1.25, and we actually forgot to look at the one. And I think it's time to do that. And of course, if, re if you reduce your IT consumption by 80%, your whole cooling architecture becomes different, and you might have much different and more options to optimize your, your cooling infrastructure than if you just go for a one-for-one -one, uh, replacement. Um, I think also the SaaS and integrator model is 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 key here. Why? Well, uh, most customers are living in this hybrid IT model, so a lot of uh, changes between on-prem, colocation, uh, cloud, a lot of movement in the IT state. So there's actually also need to continuously monitor uh, energy savings and continuously optimize that state because it's like a moving target. Uh, the IT load is changing all the time. And then uh, there's quite a complexity of data to be collected, water, carbon, uh, energy. So the integrator can actually safeguard those data, uh, keep them you know, as a sovereign um, uh, piece of intelligence to the customer and also uh, uh, outsource that part of the complexity from the operator. And then last but not least, um, yeah, IT, I think we, we, we've seen that they're sometimes a bit absent in the whole sustainability discussion. CIOs uh, look to have different priorities. Uh, also looking at the latest Beltec webinar that was confirmed. So I think they need to be more involved in this discussion and, you know, going for a bit of a multidisciplinary cooperation. And if we do that, um, I think we will be able to uh, look beyond the loss and change and then really see uh, the opportunity. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Johan. I will enable everyone for the cameras and uh, microphones. I let you decide if you want to switch on or off as a participant. Uh, the presentation is still recorded, so you have no obligation at all, of course, to start your camera if you don't want to. Um, and 
from the chat. I don't know if there were pending questions. There was a comment from Emmanuel about scalability uh, in the last uh, last minute, and there was his comment already about uh, power management. But I'll let you. I see okay. that Emmanuel is raising his hand. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Olivier. Uh, just a comment uh, with uh, agents that uh, can uh, enable power management for servers. Today, I didn't try it on server, but we have tried it on computers. And clearly, uh, let's say that the results that were expected were not rich at all. It was uh, done with uh, an independent study with the Institute for uh, it's the Institute for Research in IT in Toulouse. Uh, and clearly it was disappointing. So I really encourage if you deploy such an ad agent to first perform a proof of concept on some uh, relevant servers to really check that uh, you have uh, the, the results that are expected and to use independent means to measure the energy. So not uh, to be confident on the figures that are provided by the suppliers, but, it, but really to have a network analyzer, by example, that will record uh, yeah. the voltage and the intensity and be yeah. sure that the, the figures are reliable. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, so Emmanuel, um, when you say the results were disappointing, do you mean that switching from performance to energy mode didn't give you any um, savings or? or no, we, we had no savings for most of the, the computers that are, uh, let's say, uh, digital workplace classical computers. And for the computers that we use, by example, for uh, 3D design, the consumption okay. was increased, okay. uh, probably due to the, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, agent. Yeah. So uh, clearly, we were not convinced at all. And it was, the, 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 it was done by uh, an internship. Yeah. Uh, under the supervision of uh, two professors. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it certainly touches them on a point. Maybe I didn't make it um, during that specific slide, but the, the invitation really is to determine your power profile in function of your workload type. And for example, there's a clear indication that for, for certain uh, workloads like HPC, um, it should be probably best in performance mode, and and most of the savings can be can be got can be uh, can be obtained when you're using like general purpose uh, workloads. So maybe in your case, I think you work at Airbus, if I'm if I remember correctly, you know with three D three uh, D designs. Maybe that's not an optimal workload for uh, you know for 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 energy savings. The, the main factor was that uh, if you have a correct configuration of the computer for all the deep sleep modes, etc., in fact, uh, the IPM Plus module was playing on that. And if you are already optimized, you won't earn uh, many things. But if you are not optimized at all and that you don't have uh, energy savings mode uh, after 10 minutes, 10 minutes without any activity or thing like that, maybe yeah. it will uh, enable savings. Okay. But again, it was on the computers, and what is true on the computers is maybe not true on the servers where we are using them uh, 24 hours a day and all yeah. the year long. So ju just to mention that clearly, from my point of view, it would be interesting if a company has done uh, such a project with uh, a power management agent uh, to and uh, an independent uh, measures on the energy consumption it would be nice to to have the testimony and the return of experience okay okay there there is a paper that's coming out shortly in the IEEE uh, community uh, i have seen a, a peak preview at it but once it's publicly uh, available i will send it to you emmanuel and that is also um, giving you some scenarios and some savings don't hesitate to send it to us uh, directly uh, to Olivier and Jules, and we'll also forward to the other participants okay. the reference. Uh, Bernard, you have you raised your hand as well. Yes, I had uh, I put a question in the in the chat. In fact, uh, it was about uh, the, um, the 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 evolution of the consumption of the servers. I mean, in in uh, MIPS uh, sit same situation. In the past and certainly in the future, is there an increase of the consumption at same MIPS or a decrease? Uh, what what's happened actually in the the, the severance mode? Uh, and I, I I talk about with the same uh, 
server condition. The, 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 for example, we buy uh, classical servers, and we if we still buy this kind of server and not specific for data center, what is the evolution of the consumption at the uh, at same uh, software sphere? Let let I say it. Yeah. I think the reports that I've seen is that uh, power consumption of servers is is going up. And there's okay, also you, you have an approximation 10 percent, 20 or something like that. But uh, very I, global global uh, uh, ciphers. I will I will dig up the report. There's also a report. I think it's an uptime uh, research document. Uh, I will dig it up and send it also to the community, but it's um, there's the, there's the wrong expectation that with uh, you know Moore's law um, uh, that that power consumption of servers is actually going down, but it's not the case. And also with idle sir with idle power that's actually going up as well. Okay, thank you. Simon, you've raised your hand as well. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I was I'm looking at it from the IT community point of view, and uh, well, you probably know we are very risk averse, and we tend to uh, increase the redundancy of the the services. You know, split them into multiple virtual machines and duplicate the entire infrastructure and so on. So I was wondering. Well, it's it's more a psychological point of view, but is it some is there something that the data center can do to you know give more confidence into the stability of the system so that we don't need to duplicate five or ten times the same infrastructure just in case of? Yeah, well, I, I think you're right, Simon, that it's mainly a, a psychological problem in the sense that if you look at a full stack. Um, you know, from from the data center upwards to to the to the app, uh, every abstraction layer is building in its own redundancy. Um, so, is that really needed? Uh, a good question, but everybody does it, and everybody is taking that 20, 30 percent extra into account to deliver to the next uh, to the next layer. Uh, the data center layer in itself is 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 mostly you know if you talk about a tier three architecture, it's it's highly available. So um, which which is nice and very convenient, but in this it it does increase the number of probably idle servers, and uh, it it doesn't help at all. And if we if the increase in uh, effectiveness that we can get at the data center level is compensated on the negative side by the increase of redundancy and services that we deploy, I mean this effort is basically I won't say useless, but kind of in the end. Well, the, the 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 trend that you see more and more is that, uh, or at least the, the the business case calculation that is done then is okay. What if we would, instead of having every layer adding its redundancy, the data center, the IT layer, the network layer, why don't we reduce the data center layer in complexity, make it a simple tier one uh, facility, and then. Um, insert all of the redundancy and failover aspects at the application layer. And then instead of a tier three, tier four layer, which is still duplicated in a lot of cases, you end up with a tier one, and then you have the failover at the application layer. And that scenario is much more cost effective. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and you see that discussion more and more happening because, yeah, even with a, the 99.9, .9, um, you know, if you have that one failure, uh, you're out of the woods. So. Yep, indeed. Uh, no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I see that some people are leaving because we are a bit over time already. So very interesting presentation. Okay. I hope it was uh, fruitful for everyone who participated.